We're back and welcome to another episode of Vonday Radio and it is a great pleasure to have our, our second most uh, recurrent guest back with us today which is uh, Dr. Jesse Russell. He is a columnist for the Remnant online newspaper uh, and print newspaper and uh, websites 1 Peter 5, Crisis Magazine. Are there any uh, publications that I've left out there, Dr. Russell? Uh, there, there is there are quite a few I write for, but those right. those will work uh, now. And um, yeah, th- thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. It's an honor. Thank you. Um, it's uh, it's it's really good to talk to you again and have the opportunity to get your take on um, some of the the events we're witnessing, uh, both in in the uh, the secular world and in the Catholic Church. Um, I think that's where your commentary uh, is most most pertinent. Um, and I, I think I'd like to start by asking you about the, the Amazon Synod. So I've had uh, Julia Maloney on before to talk about the Synodal Revolution, uh, this, this mechanism that's used by, by modernist forces to affect uh, doctrinal change uh, within the Catholic Church. Um, the Amazon Synod... Um, I, I am sure that you're familiar with the the uh, commentary of Roberto Di Matteo, which is yeah. always very incisive. And I think what what he really um, drives home is that this is this is almost an ultimatum by the German hierarchs uh, to affect to to affect some of the the kind of modernist shopping list that was meant to be realized within the five, first five years of, of a Francis pontificate. Yeah, um, well, I think that if we look at this, uh, the Amazon Synod from the long view, uh, and many people have commented on this, it seems like uh, what we have is a continuation of um, the pontificate of Paul VI. Uh, if we look at um, John Paul II and Benedict XVI, some people have suggested that they were intentionally put in to kind of slow down the revolution. I think that one of the, I don't know how true that is, but one of the um, uh, key concerns of the modernists in the church is trying to prevent a breakaway of tradition traditional and conservative Catholics. Now, I'm not saying a breakaway in the sense of schism is good or illicit or anything like that, but they don't want an organized resistance against uh, their policies uh, taking the form most prominently uh, of the past several decades uh, in the Society of St. Pius X. Now, I'm not totally uncritical of Society of St. Pius X, but they don't want an organization like that or a movement like that growing uh, for a few different reasons. One, um, two of the biggest cash cows uh, for the church are the Germans who have a state tax that provides money for the church, as well as the Americans. The Amer- American Catholics, especially uh, sort of middle-of-the-road American conservative Catholics, donate or traditionally have donated a tremendous amount of money to the church. Now, there's been efforts mm-hmm and um, arguments given to um, that people should sort of refrain from giving to Peter's Pence or refrain from giving to even dioceses or local parishes, but rather give the money to traditionalist orders and organizations. I'm not condemning that or um, necessarily endorsing that, but um, I think that that's part of the method is is something that's been called uh, gaslighting, where... Uh, one day, Pope Francis will say something like, you know, he prays that St. Michael will um, uh, protect the church or entrust mm. the church to St. Joseph, something along those lines. Or when he and, quashed um, the proposal of women deacons. Yeah, I think that, that that is, he'll say that he'll say one thing and then do another mm. uh, in order to sort of gaslight the population. What is different about Francis's regime, though, is m- m- the bulk, or at least a great deal, of Catholics are on board with, uh, or at least aware of what's going on with um, Pope Francis. Now, uh, if we look at the uh, pontificate of Paul VI, um, 
people praise him for Humane Vitae, but it took many, many years for Humane Vitae to be released. And during that time, I think it was 1968 it was released, I could be wrong on the exact date, but yes, uh, many Catholics began to use birth control thinking the Pope would uh, publish an encyclical allowing it. And you had people like... Uh, In the, the uh, Gaudium et Spes, the, the Church's pastoral constitution of the modern world, promulgated in 64 or something um the the document itself uh sort of it kind of titillates um about uh new methods of science and even new methods of regulation of births and and then just kind of leaves that that sentiment hanging so you can imagine all those um priests eager for change or uh, uh, in in uh countries across the world taking that as as a sort of a carte blanche uh, a signal that the teaching is indeed going to change and so going and and so for the next few years actually passing that on to their their flock um and then of course when when you do get the 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 reaffirmation of the the uh the prohibition on artificial birth control there's outrage um, but but again, as you say, it was it there was there's there's it, there, the church was not uh, cogent uh, coherent on this issue at all. And indeed, in Humana Vitae, you have the highly problematic. That, that, that's an excellent point uh, about the Gaudium et Spes. I think I, I wrote an article about this for the run that where it's a tactic of Marxism and uh, liberation theology to change a people's praxis or what they do. And then later on, call, cause the change of theoria or theory what they believe. Mm. Um, and so, uh, for example, if the majority of Catholics are using birth control, uh, it's already a done deal. Uh, e. Michael Jones has pointed this out, where uh, both in America and Germany there was this big push in the '60s and '70s uh, to encourage Christians, specifically Catholics, to commit self-abuse. And the reason why was because once they started doing that. Um, their views of sexuality are radically going to change. Yeah. Well, and also, you, uh, I don't know how they got this statistic, but there was uh, something published where if you look at pornography, you're more likely to support gay marriage. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it, it, I think this this gaslighting technique, I, I've written a couple articles uh, on the remnant about this, that uh, in 2012 there's the, there was the infamous John Podesta um emails where he talked about a Catholic spring in the church because they wanted to have this seemingly organic movement uh, where the it looked like it's coming from the people and it's authentic because these uh, um, PAC or PAC groups that they had tried to form during the Obama era, these you know, left-wing Catholic groups, didn't really work. Yeah. And so uh, part of the method seems to have been recruiting uh, Father James Martin, who recently gave a um, interview with a woman named Judy Gold, where he talked about being raised in a Jewish household, uh, which is kind of interesting. And Father Martin's method is to give the impression that not only is homosexuality licit, but that transgenderism uh, is licit. And then at the same time, he'll turn around and say, well, I don't want to contradict the church's teaching, because he knows there's a whole generation of Catholics, especially in America, who have been raised by parents who are like JP2 conservatives. And they they wanted to do whatever the church said was licit, uh, at the same time have this kind of tender, uh, feely, uh, emotive uh, approach to dealing with uh, pastoral issues. Mm. And so uh, Father James Martin, I think, is definitely part of that. Pope Francis is as well. I mean, the majority of the normies across the world <laughs> seem to think that, if you would ask them, that Pope Francis approves of homosexuality, even though he'll back up and say no every once in a while. But the who am I to judge quote, um, uh, the Amazon Senate, all these things seem to be giving the impression to sure. the people that things are changing. So they can change or not change things or whatever. The average person is not going to go read synodal documents. They're not going to read Vatican II. They're not going to read Humana Vitae. Uh, they're just going to sort of pick up the, the sense. Well, they're better and, off not reading them because that will make them yeah, even more confused. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But, they, 
they, they, they, they won't pick up on the nuance. They'll just sort of get an impression. They'll yeah. have a mode of response. And yeah. so um, uh, we, we definitely, I think that that's the modus operandi of what's going on. Yeah. I mean, you have these pictures of, of Pope Francis with Katy Perry and with her boyfriend or one-time boyfriend, Orlando Bloom. Uh, you have these images of him, you know, with the Photoshop, no hate, and the cover of the Advocate magazine. So just as John Paul II was made into an image, John Paul II was made into an e a meme during the Cold War for American liberalism, capitalism, free markets, kind of a pan-Judeo-Christian uh, religion, mm. um, so too has Pope Francis been made into the same thing. I mean... I think one of the reasons why Pope Benedict was allegedly pressured to step down was he didn't make a good meme. He's kind of this <laughs> barbarian theologian, and he couldn't be John Paul II. And I think that, I could be wrong, but I think that he, in his overture to the Society of St. Pius X, in his um, Sumor, Sumor Pontificum, uh, he was um, sort of maybe creeping back to tr tr tradition and possibly, you know, I think I think we'll talk about in a little bit that the uh, the message of Fatima uh, caught up to him. I don't know that for sure. I'm definitely open to the possibility that Pope Benedict was just as bad or just as bad as Francis, and he's just sort of a uh, conservative um, Punch and Judy character that comes out. They bring out. Uh, I want to think that he is someone who's sincere, who has, uh, as you, Michael Jones, referred to a very American mind that he grew up in uh, at Germany, and as he got older, at Germany very much under influence of American propaganda in uh, influencing his ideas, someone who was a man of the council, but who at the end of his life began to kind of recollect um, the message of Fatima and um, have a traditionalist uh, movement. So I, I, my point is that I think that it doesn't really, in a certain sense, it doesn't matter what Amazon Sidon teaches, hmm. as long as it can be mean that uh, the church is changing its teaching once again. And, and that idea of the church's teaching being able to change is an extremely powerful idea to get in someone's head. Yeah. So if the church can change something, it can say, oh, the Old Testament is just all symbolic. Um, the uh, Jewish people are saved by practicing their t Talmudic uh, religion uh, that... Um, Protestants are saved, I, any one of those things, uh, mm -hmm. that the Mass is going to change. We're going to have a new Mass, uh, a new priesthood, a new rite of ordination, yep. uh, even a new blessing of holy water. <laughs> yep. uh, that, that as soon as that idea, the church can change, gets in the, high, the mind of a, a normie person, uh, then anything can change. Yeah. Yeah, you see that all over um, conservative Catholic writing. I'm thinking of... Ross Duthat's uh, "To Change a Church," which um, is a is an, an examination largely of uh, the synods on the family and Amoris Laetitia, be sort of anemic in its analysis, um, despite eventually uh, advocating orthodoxy in in terms of the uh, of communion for the 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 remarried. But what's irritating about that book? Well, um, I'm sure you're familiar with. Firstly, he he looks at this issue: can church teaching change? And the issue he 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 raises is usury, and he basically says yes, it has changed, but that doesn't mean that the teaching on on um, communion for those in grave sin should change. Uh, and then he 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 gives a, a brief history of the council, and he in no sense is there is there uh, an elaboration of of a third position sees. Uh, intrinsic problems with the council itself, this perception of the ability of um, uh, the the teaching of Christ to change in time, <laughs> uh, for 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 God to have one message for people in one part of history and another message, a diametrically opposed message in a different part of history, uh, somehow uh, actually manages uh, people people buy into it. Because yeah, they want the, to buy into it. Yeah, the, the teaching on usury is a little bit odd. There's a book uh, by a guy named Michael Hoffman, who I, I don't even know. I think he's still Catholic. He's some sort of state of a contest, uh, but it, And again, I'm not endorsing state of a contest, but he, um, he writes about uh, the, this gradual process from the Renaissance because of the Medici 
and uh, I believe Borgia Popes as well, mm. where there was all this chicanery to try to change the uh, definition of usury based on, um, I think initially there, there were these pawn shops that were established in northern Italy in the late Middle Ages, uh, and then like in contemporary arguments about usury, there's this idea that the value of money changes so rapidly that if you loan out money, you could very well lose some if you lose the uh, value if you don't charge some interest. But I, I think, uh, I mean, Hoffman's argument is the church has been corrupted for 400 years. Mm. I don't know how true that is. But nonetheless, it is something that needs to be examined. I mean, the, the, it is a very serious and grave, uh, traditionally viewed as a serious and grave sin, something Dante associated with sodomy, very interestingly, and blasphemy as well. Yeah. Uh, it's not just the usurers and sodomites who are in, um, I think it's Cantos 14 through 16 of the Inferno. It's not just those who are in that uh, burning desert, but those who blaspheme as well. They're kind of, it's like violation of nature. It's a serious mm -hmm. uh, evil, and I think it's something I, I, I should do more, I need to do more research on myself, but uh, it's definitely uh, the case that if, if you can change usury, why not change whether people go to communion or not? I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'd recommend Brian McCall's book, The Church and the Usurers, which which uh, delves into this very knotty issue um, and I think very persuasively concludes that the, the teaching itself hasn't changed, although uh, the application of that teaching in the world of, of uh, modern uh, finance is, 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 is fraught, um, but uh, nevertheless it hasn't changed. Um, so, uh, looking at the the wider world, then, um, because the we have to consider the Amazon Synod in the the context of the world we live in today, um, uh, a, a church that that seems ashamed of Christ, um, and a world that uh, that is following the predictions of the late nineteenth century of Leo the Thirteenth in particular, that a church cut off a, a, a state cut off from the mediation of grace from the church uh, would inevitably end up in the hands of the devil you, you're based in America, you're an American um, the the temperature of cultural and political discourse in America is quite extraordinary um, there's all sorts of uh, recognition on all sorts of sides of the, the political spectrum of the 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 crack up of of any sense of of the unity in the American polity, um, and uh, as Catholics we 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 uh, we know that to be inevitable. You know, unless uh, the Lord uh, buildeth a house, they that build build in vain. Um, and uh, the American experiment, the American proposition in ordered liberty, um, seems to be crumbling in our lifetime. Um, uh, I want. I wonder what you what you could say on that. Well, there's there's actually about eight million things just went through my head right there. But uh, yeah. I have uh, a I kind of I kind of have structured here in my notes a discussion of uh, Our Lady of Fatima and the errors of Russia, and so we'll kind of start with that and then branch out. Um, usually, uh, especially among older traditional Catholics, there's this idea that um, the Soviet Union was a communist state, and the reason why the Soviet Union was bad was because it was totalitarian, so it was anti-freedom and anti-liberal, uh, that it did not allow the free markets and had state control of the economy, and that the, the, the flooding of the world with the errors of Russia would be that sort of authoritarian, anti-capitalist, anti-liberal government. So, hmm. one, I'm not going to endorse... Yeah, communism or socialism or something like that. You cannot be a Catholic and a, a true Catholic and a socialist. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, I'm not going to endorse the authoritarianism, at least in the sense of as it was practiced in Russia. The true Catholic understanding of authoritarian government would be something similar to uh, medieval European Christian feudalism, where you have a great deal of freedom, a personal freedom to a certain degree, uh, among the everyday lives of the people that is regulated by culture. And, yeah, and interestingly, it's also the, the, the structure of uh, the Germanic or Northern European community, 
where you have uh, you know those who work, those who pray, and those who fight. And even St. Thomas Aquinas writes in, I don't want to get too off topic, but even St. Thomas Aquinas writes in De Reno, his letter to the King of Cyprus, there should be no place for traders, for, for, for business people in a community. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's not, not being offense with people in my family who work in business and stuff, but um, there is this idea that we're going to have a structured, ordered society. It's ruled by a king who, ha- who is uh, elected in a certain sense by other nobles who themselves rule over patches of areas. Who themse- uh, in those patches of areas, you have like a, a somewhat democratic, not in the modern liberal sense, but in the sense of like peasants having control of their lives and their communities and their families uh, rule within this hierarchical society. So it's not Soviet authoritarianism. So I'm not encouraging that. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about how, and we're going to see how this connects to the contemporary world and even a certain degree the Amazon Synod, how the uh, errors of Russia, at least in a certain sense, can be understood as the triumph of the sexual revolution and cultural Marxism around the world, at least in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wanted to, I, worked, I wrote this out because uh, there are a couple uh, Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox um, bloggers and YouTubers who had attacked the message of Fatima and said, this is just a CIA operation. This was a CIA operation where it was trying to uh, encourage um, people to um, uh, attack the Soviet Union. Well, one, uh, anyone who knows anything about the relationship between American intelligence and American high finance and the Soviet Union uh, would realize that they supported the Soviet Union. Two, the CIA wasn't founded until after World War II, not 1917 when the Fatima operations appeared. And three, and more importantly, the Fatima operations condemn what uh, exists in modern uh, post-World War II Western decadent um, state capitalism, or whatever you want to call it, uh, as much as they do Russia or hmm. Soviet communism. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the... Um, so for the, those who don't know, the, um, Our Lady of Fatima appeared to uh, some Portuguese children uh, from May to October of 1917. And in the first... And second part of the secret, uh, we hear Our Lady talk about hell, first of all. So she's going to frame this uh, discussion of the errors of Russia within a moral context. And she says to the children, you have seen hell, where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. And what you, if what you say is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. So she is not talking about, like, uh, freedom or liberalism. There was a book written in 2016, I believe, 2017, that I wrote a couple uh, articles about called uh, A Pope and the President, John Paul II, mm-hmm. Ronald Reagan, An Extraordinary Untold Story of the 20th Century by a guy named Paul Kanger, uh, a Reagan biographer who talks about how the triumph of American liberalism and capitalism is uh, a fulfillment of the triumph of the knife at heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is not true, um, but uh, Our Lady here is talking about uh, morality, and um, she says that if the war is going to end, so World War One will end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. So Pius XI hadn't been elected yet, so she predicted that. When you see a knight illuminated by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given you by God, that he's about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the Church and of the Holy Father. Yeah. Uh, in order to prevent this, I shall come to ask the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation the first Saturday. So here, God is going to punish the world. So I don't know how the CIA or the whatever proto-CIA and American intelligence would benefit from this. Uh, God is going to punish the world for sin. And this sin is going to be primarily pushed and endorsed. And we're going to get into the discussion of the history of the Soviet Union a second, by Western liberal capitalism. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, it will be initially pushed by the Soviet Union, um, but later on, as we'll talk about, the Soviet Union cracks down on some of these things, which is kind of interesting. Anyways, um, Our Lady continues, if my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted, and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. Now, mm. it's my—I want to say first of all, 
I'm not an expert on the Fatima message. So if I say anything that you know is contrary to the interpretations of other people who know for sure, uh, please forgive me. But it seems to be Our Lady's talking about World War II, but she's also talking about some future event where nations will be uh, annihilated. Certainly, we could be talking about World War II. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Pope, Pope Pius XII, did suffer a lot in his sort of personal day-to-day life, but he wasn't necessarily persecuted by uh, the Nazis or, or um, uh, Italians. In fact, interestingly, he, he was most upset that the uh, Western allies would promise him that they weren't going to bomb the area around Rome and Italy, and they did. I um, yeah. actually wrote an article on this for uh, Catholic Family News where I talked about initially Pius XII had hoped that Germans uh, would uh, defeat the Soviet Union. He gave money, I'm not saying this is a good thing, but he gave money to Adolf Hitler, the Corporal Adolf Hitler when he was living in Munich and told him to continue his work fighting as a communist. Uh, so I, I think, and in the first level, the, this prophecy of the eras of Russia is uh, rightly condemning the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc, which did persecute a great deal of Christians. Mm. It's also condemning uh, China as well, which did persecute and continues to persecute Christians without, Christians without a doubt. Um, and then, of course, at the end, she says, my immaculate heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she shall be converted in a period of peace to be granted to the world. So that is some future error. Uh, excuse me, era, uh, people liberal or Novus Ordo conservatives, those who are kind of adherents of liberalism, neoconservatism, seem to depict that as being the period after World War II, which America enjoyed a certain degree of peace and prosperity, but much of the world uh, had continued uh, war and violence. So it's not talking about the Cold War there Mm. or the post. It's not talking about the 90s or something like that. Mm. Uh, um, It's talking about some future event. Now, uh, of course, there was a sign in the sky on January 25th, 1938. Uh, Adolf Hitler himself thought this was a sign from whatever occult forces he was serving to go to war. Uh, after that, uh, January 25th, 1938, we had the Anschluss, the invasion of Austria, and World War II, the, the process leading up to World War II, began in earnest. Um, so we have this prophecy laid out, and most people say, well, this refers to... Uh, the Soviet Union, and to communist China, maybe Cuba, uh, their influence throughout the world during the Cold War. And I don't doubt that necessarily, but I'd like to also argue in just a second, I'll, I'll stop in a second uh, to, to give, give you room to talk, but uh, that this is going to be, a, that this could be at least, in my opinion, a prediction of the Frankfurt School and the sexual revolution in the West. Yeah. I can't remember if I've asked you this before, but... Uh... Whether you're familiar with the work of Augusto del Noche, I don't think so. Uh, well, his his work is really worth looking into. In this, he was an Italian uh, philosopher um, who who worked in the the sixties and seventies. But he he really uh, up to I think he died in in nineteen eighty nine or something. But he 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 gave a very um, insightful critique of the sexual revolution uh, and cultural Marxism. And he anticipated the eventuality of same-sex marriage, you know, when such things were, were barely whispered. Um, and and he, he also grasped that living in a technological society, we, we, we're, we're the, the, uh, the, the premises of that society are scientism and eroticism on the uh, metaphysical level. And he saw the sexual revolution as the culmination of total revolution, so revolution on the inside. And this is where Gramsci is very interesting. Uh, But this new, more dangerous, radical form of totalitarianism, um, a totalitarianism of disintegration. Um, And this this, uh, revolution was looking to destroy the, the synthesis of Rome, Athens, Jerusalem, perfected in the Catholic Church. Um which you could, you could also say philosophically uh, is a form of Platonism, um, a system of, uh, and, and, and ultimately there's a negation of transcendence. So uh, today's world that looks, as, looks at the world as a system of forces and not of values. 
and uh, he he already during the Cold War saw how the defeat of Marxism as a viable political and economic program would coincide with its ultimate triumph as a social and cultural force. So, yeah, so a philosophy championing global proletarian revolution would end up with the philosophy of Nietzsche's last man, the Western bourgeoisie. You know, those, <laughs> those, 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 those people that uh, Thomas Aquinas was so keen on in in that letter, um, and and he 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 said this would come about because of the contradiction between in Marxist thought between historical materialism which leads to relativism, and then dialectical materialism, which fuels the absolute demands, the totalizing demands of the revolutionary spirit. Classical Marxism denied traditional metaphysics uh, an elevated becoming over being, but at least retained a belief in an objective order of values reflecting the necessities of history, right? Uh, based on the, the, the prerogatives of, uh, you know, the, the proletariat. Um, but but over time, the teleology and eschatology of dialectical materialism could not withstand the, the rebellion against being, which was latent in Marx's thought. There's a spirit of negation that eventually negates Marx's own eschatology. And so this is where de Mattei is very eloquent as well in talking about this, the revolution of nothingness. You know, ultimately, that's where everything goes, you know, the culture of death. So the warfare against repression, you know, this, this synthesization with Freudianism aimed especially at marriage and the family, the most deep seated sources of oppression. Um, it was only with the advent of the sexual revolution that Marx's revolution could become truly total. Now this is where it's interesting. Marxism itself was much a much less viable political force in America than it was in Europe. But that doesn't mean that America was immune to its philosophical influence um, because he Del Noche understood that the essential metaphysical presuppositions of a technocracy, the reduction of form to force, being to history, substance to operation, truth to function, knowledge to engineering, authority to power. These are all essential elements of the American experiment present in the polity long before the arrival of the Frankfurt School. And so rather terrifyingly, uh, America, as this is what people like Wilhelm Reich and the Frankfurt School is new, is that America is the most fertile soil for sexual revolution because of its philosophical foundation and yeah, uh, e even if society in the united states calls itself christian american philosophy is essentially all atheistic it is marked by the idolatry of science the tool that will radically change humanity by producing technical development and will bring mankind all the happiness that man by his nature can desire so i think del noche grasped the essence of the crisis uh, that we face today and uh, i would i would really recommend all listeners um look into his works uh the the they've been translated recently into english from their italian by a guy called carlo lancelotti and we can see this whenever the church renounces her own inherent platonism and speaks in the language of psychology of sociology of economics and politics which you see all over something like the amazon synod uh, instrumentum laboris uh rather than her native tongues of metaphysics and theology yeah, I, I agree entirely. I mean, there's that, that was really excellent. Um, I, I, you made, made a number of very good points. Um, I think that it's it's kind of ironic. So you have the um, the one commandment, the principal commandment of Satanism is do what thou wilt. Yeah. Uh, you have Anton LaVey's uh, Book of Satan, which is basically kind of refried a Nietzschean or post-Nietzschean philosophy and Ayn Rindian uh, libertarianism. But for both of so Satanism, libertarianism, and in Marxism, the goal is radical freedom. The mm -hmm. goal is do what thou wilt, to be able to do exactly whatever you want. But at the same time, uh, you know, the, the sort of boomer con, neoconservative argument as well, you didn't really have freedom in the Soviet Union and China. That's absolutely true. But in our own, use the term technocracy, uh, which I know was used by um, – Zygmunt New Brzezinski, who was pals with John Paul II, but uh, that we have that now in America. You have it in Britain too. I mean, London is covered with uh, K 
cameras. Um, in America, everything, this conversation is collected as metadata. Recently, uh, it's be, become aware that both Muslim and leftist and right-wing terrorists are encouraged on the internet to commit crimes by the FBI. That we have these uh, monitors uh, on us constantly. So we have totalitarianism here, so it's, it's kind of a trick uh, where you were promised radical freedom and radical liberty, and then at the end you have this totalitarian government. You have the uh, libido dominandi, although that term originally means in St. Augustine the desire for power. Mm. But Saint, or E. Michael Jones' view that um, that we are ruled by our passions, controlled by them, uh, that's definitely true. And I want to make an argument that, in a certain sense, again, without endorsing the Soviet Union, um, that uh, the America and the West in general um, have more of the totalitarian government and seem to fulfill, in a certain degree, the errors of Russia. I don't want to say more than the Soviet Union, but... Yeah, well, the, uh, so um, it's kind of a meme on right-wing social media today to kind of praise uh, Joseph Stalin and uh, 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 Bre Brezhnev, these later um, uh, Soviet dictators, as being uh, reactionaries who clamped down on some of the dissident movements in the Soviet Union. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't argue that, but it's interesting that abortion was initially made legal in the Soviet Union, so there's an era of Russia right there. Yep. But then in 96, yeah. it was made illegal. Homosexuality was de decriminalized and later criminalized. And even in the end of the Soviet Union, before the uh, Pestroika and Glasnost, uh, homosexuals were pursued by the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so what's interesting in the Soviet Union, in America, when we have this like drumbeat for war against the Soviets, we have... Henry Scoop Jackson and the neocons who go from being Trotskyites, who Trotsky's initial movement and Lenin's uh, control over the Communist Party led to all this degeneracy, uh, that these people vehemently, constantly attack the Soviet Union when it begins to clamp down on revolution within itself. Now, I'm not saying these guys are good leaders in the Soviet Union. It's just interesting to look at that, to say, you know, okay, this the initial movement in the Soviet Union are these uh, sexual revolution uh, right. acts, uh, th these revolutionary acts are clamped down on, uh, and then all of a sudden you have all these former, these emigres from Russia, Poland, Eastern Europe, who go to New York City, and then infiltrate the conservative movement in America, and they're beating the drum against Russia uh, as a totalitarian, authoritarian uh, government that is keeping out progressive and free ideas defeat of the the revolutionary element um, Absolutely, led by yes. Trotsky in the 20s with a Russian Stalinist element which which was just as horrendous um, but and then and then in the 60s you have the the Soviets support for the Palestinians and for, for yes, Arab so. nationalists which which uh, and uh, anti-Zionism which really antagonized Jewish interests uh, and and that's where you start to see this uh, migration of um, you know former Jewish socialists into so-called uh, conservatism yeah that's interesting that they said the reason why the Soviets are depicting bad I don't know if you've ever seen uh, it's one of the later American Rocky movies I think it's Rocky 4 where he fights uh, I think his name is Ivan Drago or something that's oh, Russian Dolph, Dolph Lund yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's a song about how great America is uh, in the movie because we have McDonald's, Coca-Cola, uh, freedom, pride in the song, and sexual freedom, that sort of thing. And so yeah. it's interesting how this narrative was created uh, in the West. Um, yeah. a, a lot of people have talked about like the movies released during this time. You know, e. Michael Jones talks about The Pawnbroker, Rosemary's Baby, the, the Battle with the Production Code. I want to kind of talk about some other sort of strange things that are unleashed after World War II uh, that, in my view, are the coming to fruition of the errors of Russia. First, there are a couple kind of seemingly humorous um, uh, but ultimately very serious uh, inventions. The first one is the bikini, uh, mm. which is released on July 5th, 1946. Yep. Uh, the Catholic Church at this time objected to it. Uh, mm. The first person to model it was a woman named Micheline, Bernardini, who was a stripper, mm -hmm. uh, in the early 1960s in Sports Illustrated, which was owned by Henry Luce, who was a CIA asset, yep. uh, the bikini first appeared, 
And the first, you know, uh, major movie that depicted a bikini was Dr. No, uh, which was uh, originally a book by a British Bond. intelligence. Bond, yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. the like, uh, Ursula Andress coming out of yes. the sea. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you have this, uh, and the, the argument given was that it was going to explode uh, the, uh, sexuality the way that the um, nuclear testing was done on the bikini at all. Uh, interestingly, too, uh, you have the uh, production of the miniskirt in the 1940s. Uh, in 1954, show Flash Gordon, you have this sci-fi miniskirt, and it later on became the symbol of the swinging London of the 1960s. No. Uh, the last kind of knick-knack that I'll mention is Barbie, uh, which is based on a German prostitute, the Build Lily doll, that was marketed in America uh, by a woman named Ruth Handler. Mm -hmm. You only get one guess what her ethnic background was. Marketed as, supposedly as a way of empowering women. So it's it's my view that the the errors of Russia are uh, manifest themselves at least at the initial level with the whole pornographic culture of the West, which is exported to the world. In America and Britain as well, we fought we fought these wars for the past twenty years, trying to destroy uh, a secular uh, or successfully destroying a secular uh, Arab ruler in Iraq who banned pornography, who was not a good man, Saddam Hussein, mm -hmm. uh, in order to bring them uh, pornography, McDonald's, uh, mm -hmm. usury, uh, gay marriage, and now the Iraqis actually are demanding the Americans leave. Uh, in Afghanistan, we destroyed a, we didn't destroy, but we defeated, at least on a certain level, a terrorist organization that has curtailed the distribution of uh, opium. Now in America, we have an opioid crisis where somehow magically uh, a country that's occupied by the United States is allowing uh, opioids to pour throughout our country. And so you have the, the drug yeah. element as well. 80% of the world's opium comes from Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. so it's this big mystery how it gets here. And there's an interesting a lot of research done in the Vietnam War as well, and how the original, it was a golden triangle, I believe it was called, uh, opioids were brought out of Southeast Asia to America uh, by at least elements working within the military. Well, the same thing is done in the Golden Crescent today uh, in Afghanistan. Um, so what, what's interesting is that we have the sex, drugs, and rock and roll culture of the 1960s. This seems to be the errors of Russia, and um, why? Because uh, because of the change in Marxism that you've talked about, uh, and how in the Frankfurt School, uh, which initially began in Weimar, Germany. Now, again, Weimar, Germany is a meme on the internet today, and there's a lot of argument that, uh, I, I don't know, let me give this an example. Have you ever seen the movie Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade? Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's some good, kind of campy things, but there's a scene in there where uh, the, the, the Germans are burning these books, mm. and Indiana Jones makes a joke about th this Elsa, the, the Nazi girl, whatever, that she's going to burn the Grail diary, and I always assume that... Oh, and he Nazis meets Hitler, burned... doesn't he? And he signs yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, what, what, what's interesting is that uh, I always thought, as a young boy watching that, that they were burning, like, Arthuriana or something like that, mm -hmm. like uh, like mythological books that Indiana Jones' dad was interested in, or they were just so anti-knowledge and anti-wisdom. But, and again, this is not endorsing National Socialism, but the books they were burning were books uh, produced by organizations like the Institute for Social Research at the Goethe University in Frankfurt, which was founded in 1923 by a group of uh, Marxists, mm -hmm. and later became known as the Frankfurt School. So... Again, I'm not endorsing book burning, or I'm not endorsing um, you know, violence or national socialism. My point is, is that the books that were largely being burned were books that, as we'll see in a second, endorsed uh, divorce, uh, abortion, pornography, homosexuality, self-abuse, pedophilia, BCA, all kinds of disgusting, horrid things. Uh, and these were the bulk of books that were being burned. Um, so as, as you talked about what, what happened when this is kind of a, a meme on the internet too, that, you know, the, uh, a lot of Marxists got gained power in the West and they didn't want to give up their money or later on they made a devil's bargain through Michel Foucault, as Michael Jones talks about, uh, with the West saying, keep capitalism as long as we have sexual and racial revolution. And so, um, th th there was a figure in Hungary, uh, Gregor, uh, Lukács, 
who strangely came from a banking family and who became a member of the Frankfurt School. But uh, during the Hungarian Soviet Republic, he became uh, the Commissar for Education and Culture, and he weighed something which he called cultural terrorism. That's very interesting. In America and in Britain, too, it's like, we got to get rid of Sadiq Khan because he allows terrorism. Uh, all these Muslims are going to commit acts of terrorism, which they do. I don't doubt that. But what's interesting is that he has this term cultural terrorism. Now, what was cultural terrorism? It was graphic sex ed, which was distributed to children. Now, I know Joe Atwell talks about how he introduced, uh, Lukash introduced his fairy tales and cartoons and stuff. I think it is true that um, if you look at way, especially Americans identify with Disney, uh, that there is a kind of infantilization that has gone on. It's been deliberate. But I don't think the use of fairy tales or myths or stories about animals, which is as old as there are humans, uh, is necessarily it, itself bad. Nonetheless, the sex education, which uh, was very graphic, uh, was something that he was doing to destroy Hungary. And that's very interesting when you think of that, especially in America. I know uh, we are talking a little bit before the show started. I, I'm a little bit older than you, but I remember debates about sex education uh, in the 80s and 90s in America. And um, uh, as you probably know, that the reason why we had that was because of the AIDS scare. The idea that we need to teach children how to have sex, including gay sex, uh, safely, supposedly, in order that they don't get AIDS. Mm. Uh, and this was done in Hungary as a form of uh, cultural terrorism. So he's kind of the first figure that I mentioned here, in the, uh, who eventually came to the United States. Uh, Gregor Lukas died in 1971. And there's the more famous uh, Theodore Dono as well, uh, who was at least involved. He didn't necessarily write the uh, authoritarian personality, um, but he was. Uh, he, he wrote an essay in there, and he was part of that movement uh, that was pushed by the American Jewish Committee in America after World War II, directing it toward uh, people, um, some of whom were vets of the, of, of the Second World War. I believe it was after World War II. That double check on that. But nonetheless, targeting ethnic Catholics specifically, uh, trying to deconstruct their personality and try to find these sort of supposed prejudice they had, especially the supposed prejudice of uh, European males. So it, 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 this attack that we see nonstop, now we have a black woman as James Bond, uh, this constant attack on um, European males is not just simply this ethnic rivalry, but it is, in my view, a manifestation of the errors of Russia, this idea of breaking down, and this is done to other ethnic communities as well, breaking down Muslim men, black men, but breaking down European men as well and turning us into slaves or uh, feminizing us. It's not simply an issue of gender or race, but it's a, it's, it's spiritual attack as well. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I see... Um history history uh, ca can only be seen uh, it's not it's not about ethnic conflict it's not about best but it's a it's a battle between the devil and christ throughout history throughout salvation history now there's there's a couple of things i was noting down as you were speaking that was really interesting what you were saying so the first thing i wanted to say was that um you mentioned bikinis and uh, I can't. I think it is the rev, the revelations at Fatima, the apparition, or or else another Marian apparition. Um, Our Lady says there will appear fashions that gravely offend my son. Just real quickly, that, that, that's what I forgot to mention, uh, Sister Yacinta. Or Yacinta mentioned that there are certain fashions will be introduced that will offend our Lord very much, and more souls go to hell for sins of less than any other reason. So it seems to be. An attack on the family, there's, there, there's a quote uh, from the Fatima story about that, an attack on purity. Mm. So, again, these are not economic issues. It's not as though American intelligence made this up and said, we need to fight the Soviets. This is condemning the degenerate culture the West is going to export the world over. Yes, and so there's, there's, a, there's an, an, an effort, a concerted effort to market and... Uh, promote uh, fashions, Im immodest fashions like the bikini. And indeed, if you look at how women st be began to dress and dress to this day, they dress how, you know, if, if you transported someone from as recently as the early 20th century and right back throughout the whole of human history and across most cultures, how uh, prostitutes would 
would be identified. And slaves too. Yes. Recently, I, I had the misfortune, and I regret doing it. But nevertheless, I, I was I was in a a, a a large British city, and I went out for for drinks with some friends on a Saturday night. Of course, this was when all the all the clubbers were out. the The weather was was fine. What I noticed is that the the women were wearing more uh, more immodest clothing than they had when I last was in that situation as as recently as three years ago. So so three years ago that you know a girl might on a night out wear a very very uh, tight uh, little black dress type thing, whereas I noticed it, now there were girls just wearing a bra and and just a oh, skirt. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it's like it, it, people think you know the sexual revolution we've kind of turned a corner. There was the it started in the sixties and and now things are getting slightly better. You know, you look teenage pregnancies down and all these things and. And uh, and I want to say the the sexual revolution has got worse and it's getting worse. We're getting deeper and deeper into this thing. The fashions that are around today are are immodest even by the standards of the nineties. You know yeah. things like yoga pants. It's just it's just only heading in one direction. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I remember I went to a liberal Catholic school and a girl wore a miniskirt. It was a big deal. It was like they they talked to her parents. Is there something wrong going on at home? You know, it's interesting too if you look at especially we'll tie this into the Epstein case here, but how in a lot of these um, writings by a certain Middle Eastern group, their Talmud, uh, talk about our, our women as being, not just ours, but like non-Jewish women as being like slaves, as shikses, as pieces of meat, as prostitutes. And you look at Barbie, Barbie was given to young girls throughout the West by a member of that tribe, uh, and Barbie was originally a prostitute. Right. So like the first interaction they have with an adult woman or especially if their mom goes off to work or something or sitting around playing with a prostitute doll. And this kind of this feedback loop occurs where I don't even know. I don't watch television. I'm not saying that to be hoity toity or whatever. Uh, I don't really watch normie YouTube videos, <laughs> but it's my impression that that's what people are wearing on there. And you have um young people who uh, come from uh, backgrounds where there is no connection with their parents. It's not even like when I was younger, it's like your parents get divorced or whatever. Mm -hmm. Here it's like you might not have a father, period, or your parents are basically the bad kids I went to high school with or something. <laughs> and like, yeah, yeah. so they, they, they latch on to these devices. They, 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 there's this beautiful quote from Martin Heidegger about, you know, loyalty to one's place, one's family. Uh, and how that strikes the deepest core of our being, well, these children who are traumatized or never even necessarily traumatized, never given, you know, real love, latch on to these figures. Uh, like in America, we have this country singer, Taylor Swift or Beyonce or whoever, and they dress like this, and they've done this intentionally to create this, like, farm uh, for Jeffrey Epstein, a farm of prostitutes. Hmm. Uh, and hmm. if you read it in the, the newspapers, he wanted to breed a farm of prostitutes or whatever, or supposedly master race or something, but I think it was probably a breeding farm for human trafficking. That was in the New York Times. They said it was for eugenics, but I don't think it was. But anyways, my point is, uh, absolutely, they've interiorized this idea of being a slave, of someone who's going to uh, either not have children or, you know, wreck their gene pool by marrying, you know, a real low-quality guy or getting together with him and having a child. And they've interiorized being a whore, whereas even in the 90s, like when I was in high school, it was like there were bad girls and good girls. You know what I mean? Now it's like everyone is bad. Even like, and what's interesting too is the older women will imitate the younger ones. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have like older women dressing immodestly or even women who are like younger grandmothers dressing immodestly, imitating the um, young people. And it seems to be, and, and maybe we'll talk about more some of these words, but this was done by design. This was supposed to liberate us from Christianity, from the patriarchy, but what it does is turn someone into a slave, a prostitute, excuse me, a prostitute slave of some kind. So we we know about uh, uh, Foucault's deal with the devil and the the, the 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 further degeneration of the left, you could say, um, in in basically 
forgetting uh, economic justice, trade union collective action, uh, fair wages, um, any any um, cause that could be an annoyance to the oligarchs, um, and its substitution with uh, cultural revolution. So the um, the the elevation of minorities, women, gays, homosexuals, etc., as the the revolutionary class instead of the proletariat. I think this was manifest um, in the U.S. in the Clinton administration and uh, the, the the New Democrats, uh, the Clintonian Third Way, which which you know through the repeal of Glass Steagall or whatever removed regulation on the activities of high finance and Wall Street, um, but at the same time advanced. Um, uh, cultural degradation. Now, and the equivalent for us is the Blair government, the Tony Blair government with New <laughs> Labour, and it's you know they were very very similar times, and you know they they seem to coordinate. Clinton and Blair seem to be good friends, and it's very interesting. You look at Blair, his his rise through the party. Um, he he uh, famously uh, revoked Clause Four, which was a, an article in the Labour Constitution, which said that the the goal of the party was to democratically uh, work for the uh, for worker ownership of the means of production. So he he got ri- he got rid of that for that leftist clause. There was an interview in the nineties for when he was newly elected to one of his cabinet members, and it was quite a sort of girly chit chatty interview. So she managed to elicit a degree of openness from this Labour minister, who said to her that under New Labour, women will become more promiscuous. That is an election promise. So I th- I thought that was a revealing about what what really drives these people and what they seek to achieve. You know, we go back to the American original sin, the First Amendment, is that there is no such thing as separation of church and state. There will always be an animating philosophy, a religion, if you will, for any particular society. So you have two models of of integralism. The 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 public religion of the West today is not Christianity; it's it's homosexuality. There is no neutral position. So we have our own form of of heresy for anyone that contravenes that religion. But clearly, this homosexual time we live in is is because of contraception. Because homosexuality is a is a genus of the species of uh, of sorry contraception is is a genus of the species of sodomy so a, a a contraceptive culture will be a queer culture you know what's interesting is that you know ellen degeneres um recently revealed that her father had sex or stepfather had sexually abused her and, and this is something that has been kind of present in christian circles for a long time but it's kind of hitting more of the mainstream right is that homosexuality is the result of sexual trauma and yeah, it's like yeah, you have all these decades of, uh, you know, dads, grandfathers, whatever, who are looking at pornography in the shed or whatever it is, and, you know, who are constantly bombarded with this pornographic culture and who, um, you know, out on this by harming, you know, their children or neglecting their children, you know. And it, what's interesting, I'm kind of countersing you a little bit on Clinton and Blair. I agree with you, but what's interesting is that you know, who who was the – president uh, during the me decade in which we had enormous sea change in the sexual norms of America uh, that coincided with a radical setting back of the 20th century gains for labor, uh, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan Mm -hmm. was the movie star president. He was the president who met with Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. He was the president of Coca-Cola and Freedom. And I don't know, I don't think, I mean, that's not the meme that Margaret Thatcher was, but it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but she did do a lot of the same sort of privatization of Britain and breaking stripes and that sort of thing to break down the working class. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Great- no, she, she took she took the, the family wage away from the, the working class man and so created the underclass, the lumpen proletariat that, that is the state of the... The British working class today, um, and effectively, you know, the single mother family model and the pornographic male. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, what's weird is that uh, the assassination attempts in John Paul II. I don't know if we've talked about this before, 
But drama second, Margaret Thatcher at the Brighton Hotel uh, and uh, Ronald Reagan were all very close to one another. Mm. And there is reason to believe that that was a warning to all three of them. All three of them became, there's even a book written by all three of them together uh, called, um, I forget what it's called, it was written by a, an, an Irish, British, uh, who wrote, a man who wrote for the National Review, mm. uh, uh, the Pope, the Prime Minister, and the President. Yep. And But anyways, these figures were Cold War representatives of, you know, American or Anglo-American liberalism who are presented as like the conservative fallback. So mm. if you don't like Sadiq Khan or Gordon Brown or whatever, you don't like Bill Clinton, you don't like Obama, you, you should probably like Reagan. Or if you don't like Pope Francis, you should like John Paul II or whatever. So um, I think that it's important to examine the effect these people had, their policies had on our countries and throughout the world, uh, and then whether or not they themselves were warned or punished or whatever and told to get on get on track with the agenda. I think that's definitely the case with President Nixon in the United States, that he tried to fight the um, religious group, in brackets, uh, in America, and uh, he lost. Mm. He was the last wasp to do that. Reagan, who was a Hollywood kind of just goofball, who had a handler who was a mafia, and this is in the, the, the main news, he was in the circle of, I think it was Lou Wasserman, uh, a religious group, uh, <laughs> um, Hollywood mafia figure, and he was put on stage and booked. It's my, my opinion that he, John Paul II and Margaret Thatcher, each given a warning, uh, a very serious warning not to, um, you know, move off the script. And so mm. their policies been exceptionally disastrous. I don't know if you heard the interview with um, James Greer, is his name, who was on, um, the, the, the abuse victim of Cardinal McCarrick was on Taylor Marsh. Yeah, and he was talking about John Paul II knew about Cardinal McCarrick, and he did nothing because of all the money Cardinal McCarrick brought in that John Paul II could use for his charities. Yep. There's, there's a, another uh, dynamic that I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, Dr. Russell, which is desensitization. And I think this plays a key role in cultural revolution. So if you look at something like the Monica Lewinsky affair, you had, I, I don't remember it, but you had graphic and endless details about oral sex on every mm. news program and newspaper for over a year, round the clock, for, for, for on primetime television with people, you know, children watching, uh, and salacious details over the blue dress, etc., just before internet pornography is released and it gets it on everyone's subconscious and something i've noticed in recent the uh, last couple of years um you know about the bbc of course um yeah. that that's one of the few news um services which isn't behind a paywall so most people check bbc news once a day on their iphone to to get just a sense of what what is going on um, and obviously it has the, the, the left-wing bias and everything else like that. But there's another uh, kind of deeper dynamic that I've noticed. And that is that it's getting more and more titillating and more and more BuzzFeed-y, uh, if that makes sense. So there's there's just, there's every day now, there is an article on something that I believe is designed to desensitize. So you'll have a, an article about uh, female genital mutilation uh, but it'll be very graphic in its descriptions um, and then you'll have a story on on lap dancers joining a union or an in-depth photo essay on amsterdam's red light district there is even an article you know 11 ways to get your one night stand to wear a condom and this is just on you know this is on a publicly funded so-called you know reputable news source um, an article on Dan Bilzerian trying to break into the UK cannabis market with titillating details about his Instagram reel. And and uh, I make this point because it's, it's such a difference to how it was a few years ago. And I remember it at school, kids would just kind of go on BBC News just to get a sense of what's going on. And I can't help but think those kids today who now go on BBC News will be hit by these these very graphic items that will just slowly erode their their inhibitions um, and this is from you know a government website and I, I just thought I just recall you know E. Michael Jones talk about how the vagina monologues was put on at St. Mary's College 
uh, a girls' Catholic college, and uh, they got the girls to 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 chant vagina, uh, which which breaks down their natural innocence, their natural inhibitions. Um, just and you, and the BBC one is so insidious because it, it's talking about you know they can say well we're talking about it in a completely scientific way, but just by talking endlessly about female circumcision or or whatever, uh, they desensitise people to to the the culture of death. Um, yeah, there's a there's like a, again eight million things I could say about that. Um, mm. the, the, I'll, I'll just well, I'll start with this. So on the uh, on the right, on the uh, social media, there's a meme about bride gathering, this idea of the preciousness of females in the community and the need to sort of protect them and keep them uh, safe in order to perpetuate the ethnic group and how there are so many ways in which females are tapped yep. and broke down and turned into this prostitute type. And, they're, they're, I mean, regardless if the listener is Catholic or Christian or whatever, there's no doubt that among females, there's ample evidence that pr promiscuity, even minor promiscuity, leads to severe mental health issues. There's no question at all yeah. uh, about that, which in turn leads to drug use, which in turn leads to perpetuation of those itch issues. Um, two, uh, we know t from E. Michael Jones and others that this is what Israel does to the Palestinians, Ramallah, broadcast pornography on um, a city or town has been taken over. Three, we know from the Frankfurt School, there's a lot I didn't get into, which is fine, but people like William Wright, Herbert McCuse, um, Gregor Lucas, they explicitly said, we are going to use the sexual revolution to destroy the West. It's in their books, which are published by academic presses, which are taught in American universities. There's no question. So this is a warfare against us. It's a warfare. It's a spiritual warfare against the whole world. I want to mm -hmm. make that clear. But and it's throughout the Islamic world, throughout China, throughout Japan. Japan is a country also. It's been destroyed, and a lot of things we think of of being Japanese anime, this huge Tokyo with all these glass buildings or whatever. That is the American Empire or Japan. Jap authentic Japanese culture trying to struggle its way through the American Empire. But the Japanese people is a group that's not Christian. It's not European, but nonetheless, they've been destroyed. The Japanese male, especially, has been destroyed. Absolutely. Uh, enslaved by this culture. And so that way, we'll never again have uh, an attempt at uh, Japan to have its own little empire or for the Japanese people to um, function as a normal, healthy people. What's interesting, too, I mean, this is a discussion for another time, but is the history, and this sounds nuts. I'm someone who's not a so – I, I don't believe the Freemasons control the world. But the history of Freemasonry of Japan from the 19th century forward is a very, especially secret societies from the West in Japan, is, is a very interesting uh, discussion. I think there's a couple of books written on it in academic press. But anyways, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to old man post here, but I, I distinctly remember a time when there were debates between Tipper Gore, Al Gore's wife, and then the lead singer of Sister Sister, uh, an 80s uh, hair band uh, about the degeneracy in their lyrics. I remember a time when there were censored CDs you could buy at the store, uh, where it's, or after that there was the parental advisory, explicit lyrics or whatever. Uh, there definitely is this idea that if we expose people to this material, it'll get them to sin, it enslaves them, it traumatizes them. I can't tell you how many little kids uh, that I know or young people I see who are not at the age which um, people go out and date and sort of thing, who have uh, had this have this look about them of someone who's seen pornography. I mean, again, I know that's kind of speculative, yeah, but yeah. many priests as well say, yeah, I got little kids coming in the confessional confessing looking at pornography. And, and the moment what, they what see this? that image, yeah. childhood ends. Yeah. So what you have is it. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, but I was just going to say, I don't want to get too gross or too detailed, but there are things that young people talk about today, uh, even done between men and women, that when I was a kid or younger, like, I didn't even know about. Or it's assumed that, like, perverts and rapists and degenerates and, like, people that belong in jail would do those sort of things. You know, and it's, it's, it's also, that, again, I don't want to harp on religious group, but... Some of that stuff is something that's stereotypically promoted within their own culture. 
uh, certain behavior, especially involving like, you know, the, the, the back end of a person, even a female, you know, it's mm-hmm. like uh, just stuff that you think that's what mentally ill people do yep. uh, or something like that. And this is promoted. It's in rap music. It's mm-hmm. in uh, television now or Netflix or whatever it is people watch. And this is clearly meant to act as a form of birth control, to humiliate us and to enslave us, uh, and to ultimately, you know, lead our souls to hell. And it, it, what's so tragic about this is is the shepherds failing to protect their flock and to realise how bad things are. That you know they should be thundering from the pulpits about this. But you're you're right. The the culture uh, has been pushing focus on on the backside for a long time you know the kardashians miley cyrus twerking this is all conditioning people to accept and participate in homosexuality quite clearly that stuff is also uh, part of satanic and occult ritual so it's even since there's a weird i don't know if you've ever read the canterbury tales there's a weird yeah scene in the is it the miller's tale or the carpenter's i forget where a something like that occurs yeah. and um th- th- it's definitely that it, it, w- w- witches were accused of doing things like that so it's definitely like this inversion of where uh of the way things should be done yeah well scambra talks about that you know someone with yeah. with much much uh history yeah. um yeah. and he, he he is very honest about how it's it's a kind of uh diabolical Demons, this is something some Catholics have talked about, that demons were visible and they'll become visible again. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, the final thing, I, I, don't, I don't think it's possible for humans and angels to pure spirit. Yeah. It's true that in demonology there's discussion of humans having some sort of sexual ritual. And I don't know, have you seen the movie um, Blade Runner 2049? The, the woman inhabits the body, the, uh, the, this computer program inhabits the body of the prostitute. Now, that is something that in the forms of shamanistic possession, uh, sex magic and that sort of thing is something that did occur, or at least in the occult, they believe can occur with demons. So it's very possible something like that can happen, something like possession from conception yeah. of a child. Mm-hmm. So we talk about like these new sort of people being produced or, you know, sex with demons it's not demons but it could be some sort of ritual where there's a prostitute substitute where you have two people are possessed some some sort of activity that goes on and this is present you know in just academic anthropological writings where people believe this happens it's present in the cult uh and it's present in christian demonology too of like incubus and succubus uh merlin supposedly was the child of a demon and a nun i don't think that's true uh but i believe uh, merlin really was a welsh wizard but uh, that folklore was present. So I, I definitely believe that with all the UFO stuff that's going on now, that we'll have some sort of first contact that is actually, as Jim Farlock and you have said, a demon or some sort of like hoax or something that, that's going to happen that, in, in our lifetimes, I believe. Yeah. Well, you've, you've got a, an all-out clown world that the gloves are yeah. off. I think if a company openly displayed pedophilia, in its marketing, I think it would only cause a ten percent dent in profits at most at this point. Um, and this 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 touches on everything that we've said so far. And you know there there are these nefarious uh, servants of the devil working away. But at the end of the day, we also get the leaders we deserve. Uh, secret societies, different interest groups can push pornography and all these things. But I still have to make that decision to look at it. You know, I, we've got an out assault on the, the heterosexual world, the family, because it is generative. And they want to shift as quickly as possible from a family model to a brave new world model, where the state has responsibility for child production. Yeah, absolutely. It will be a, a, a collection of slaves. It's interesting, in America, we have Walmart and Whole Foods. And I always make the joke that, it's not really a joke, but that, that Walmart is for the Deltas. So they'll go and get their soil in or whatever there. Hmm. And then if you're like an engineer uh, or something to help design George Soros's computer that he's going to be uploaded into or thinks he's going to be uploaded into, then you get to go to Whole Foods and get a little bit better soil in. Because you, you have these like, uh, you know, different, you know, grocery stores that have different neighborhoods. But I mean, I think that I mean, we've gone on for a little bit. But there's one last thing I wanted to mention 
uh, real quickly, which is the attacks on the church in France uh, and the Notre Dame fire. I think there's been a lot talked about that, which is interesting. Uh, just a couple quick points on that. Um, so kind of tying this all together, that this, there was a very good video by someone who's a pagan, actually, uh, on uh, the, the Internet, but he was talking about how these attacks on the West are by Antifa, by these different groups, these strange church burnings throughout Europe are being funded and organized by someone higher up. We know for a fact that George Soros and others, uh, George Soros himself was uh, seated, his money was seated by the Rothschilds, or at least two Rothschild bankers, mm -hmm. that they do pay for these events to happen. But the, the, these people, these kind of like zombie, you know, woke left social justice warriors are being financed by the um, oligarchs, What's interesting, uh, just just two things about that, is that you have before the Notre Dame fire in April, you have a whole string of attacks on churches throughout France, including a fire in Saint Sulpice in March 17th. Yeah. Uh, what's also interesting is that the response to this by the head of the French bishops was, is he uh, uh, Georges Pontier? He says, "We adopt a reasonable attitude. We do not develop a discourse of persecution. We do not wish to complain." We are not victims of Catholicophobia. In its history, Judaism has fought an ongoing struggle with anti-Semitic groups. We Catholics in France do not have to face its violence today. So, this this is like and the immediate thing. statement after the yeah. Notre Dame fire as yeah. well. Yeah, just ruling out arson before any kind of investigation could ever have been conducted. Yeah, well, I know personally people who are uh, arson investigators, both firefighters and uh, a friend of mine who's a a uh, lawyer who does a similar thing, it takes sometimes months, mm -hmm. if not years, for a house fire or a trailer fire. Mm -hmm. You know, like this is a lengthy process that they have to go through. Yep. Um, so th th to say that it's ridiculous, but it's weird. As the bishop said, this is not a persecution, it's not a big deal. It's my view that these are like Antifa-type groups tied with the occult. It could have been Muslims, but I don't think so. I don't doubt Muslims would do that. I don't think they're our friends. I don't think they should be able to move in our countries. I want them to convert to the true faith. Uh, but this is something that's being done, hmm. uh, this vandalism, and especially like the proliferation of satanic uh, imagery that they paint on the walls of the church and stuff. This is, this is an yep. all-out attack yep. uh, by these little mercenary groups. Yep. And uh, kind of one last point on that is that this kind of a warning. I know that there are a lot of Catholics who are involved with the alt right or these different organizations, but it's it's my view, and maybe it's something we can talk about a different time. That these organizations at the top are controlled by another half of the dialectic. I had a conversation actually with E. Michael Jones about this. I won't say what he shared with me, but uh, he said something very interesting about that after he had his debate with Richard Spencer and Jim Go to Mark Brahman. Um, so I would be very, I would say to Catholics that, you know, we obviously have a right to defend our ethnicity. Obviously, uh, we are under attack as a people, as, as of European descent. But I would not get involved with these groups. I'm just going to say that now, uh, and uh, at least the majority of them, that these people are ultimately controlled by the same dialectic, just like the Soviets, the liberal forces of the West, and then ultimately the National Socialists were all controlled by the same dialectic as well. Do you, do you think do you think there was you know there the 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 master conspiracy is that powerful that it is well, it's 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 uh, orchestrated the you know whatever they yeah want. well let me put it this I think it's ultimately demonic yes and that, that that's, that's you know you cool. just look at this is kind of a, a silly example but like so in America in World War Two our tanks are painted with a pentagram a yeah. masonic symbol of the uh, um, uh, planet Venus. Yeah. Uh, the Soviets had the hammer and sickle, the hammer of the father sky god or the hammer of the worker. Yeah. And then the Nazis have a swastika, which is an ancient occult symbol of the sun, of Apollo. And these, these, these forces are fighting each other. And what's the result? The destruction of Christianity, the, the mass slaughter of European and Asian people, yeah. um, and the creation after that of the New World Order. You know, the same thing, uh, the, the battles between America and Iraq and, and uh, the Islamic world. It's a battle between, you know, the crescent, the people who serve the moon goddess, uh, which is that crescent originally comes from, uh, and those who served, you know, 
or whatever demon Venus represents with the star. And what does it do? It kills people. It kills Christians in the Middle East. It destroys these countries. It inflames Islamic radicals. And then in the other half, it's fine. I mean, like, the more young British and American and French and German boys who are radical, who embrace paganism, who go out and do these shootings or whatever, uh, the, the, the better for this, the, the, this ultimate hierarchy. Uh, now, again... It's, always, I, it's I always Christ that's crucified at the end. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's not as though that the, this is like the Masons. The Masons, I think, are played out. They were big in the 18th century and the 19th century, the mid-20th century. But that's over with. There's new secret well, ways of terrorism, and yeah. now we're going to roll on to the next one. We have these groups like Black Cube, and you know it is true that religious group is um, a big part of that. But they're not the only people. I was doing a lot yeah. of research with the, the Tro affair, and there are plenty of continental Europeans involved in human trafficking of other continental Europeans, uh, sexual abuse, occultism, arms trafficking, um, implementing policies to destroy. Uh, our home countries because these guys are part of the same secret societies. Now, they may fight. These societies don't exist for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. They are not monolithic. They fight against each other. Uh, they come and go over time. They change their policies and whatever else. But they serve the same master, which is the devil. Yep. Uh, and, and one thing just on the World War Two thing again, it's not insignificant that most of the, the Catholic nations at that time were neutral. So Spain, Franco Spain, Salazar's Portugal, De Valera's yeah. Ireland, the whole of South America, they could see that this was a battle, a war between three evil forces of fascism, of communism, of liberalism. These in America, and I know Britain too. There are a lot of people who, I mean, that's why we have this crackdown on nationalism in the United States because, I mean, the number has to be in the millions, especially when we look at Australia, America, even South America, South Africa, of young men and women who are interested in these groups who are fundamentally have legitimate grievances, but they are pagan in the end. And, um, you know, you look at, I don't want to get too off topic, but I was, you know, re reading a biography actually of Adolf Hitler and look at the tremendous disregard for German life he had. Oh, yeah. uh, especially at the Eastern Front, yeah. and at the end of the war. Oh, at the end, he uh, thought the country he the country was not worthy of his genius, had proved yeah, itself uh, <laughs> unworthy to be to be led by him. They are leading us into the same, you know, end times slave state. If you look at Blessed Charles of Austria, he was someone who was, uh, especially when he was trying to claim his throne, someone I would argue is too too weak. We we, we do need strong Catholic leaders, without a doubt, are, are very weak. I mean, you look at these people, you mentioned Clinton and Tony Blair, they're really generic, cowardly people. And uh, the, I don't know if I should... I was talking to a friend of mine from Lebanon, uh, who's actually he's originally Maronite, but now he goes to a traditional Latin right parish because he lives in America. But he was talking about the Lebanese War in 2006. And I said, how is it that you know, these, these groups in Lebanon were able to defeat the Israelis. And they said, well, the Israelis have all this American technology, but they're cowards. And you would have, and again, I'm not endorsing especially these Islamic groups, but they fought with courage. And when they went out and met with discipline and courage, and again, I'm not encouraging violence or anything like that. My point is that that spirit of courage is needed because when these groups went out and met Israel with courage mm. and organization, they were able to defeat them because... You know, the, the, these different groups, not just Israel, but, you know, throughout the West as well, who, you know, are themselves degenerates. And, and part of their desire to destroy us is they want us to, to make us like, like them. Like, they are mm. full of what Nietzsche calls resentment. They, they hate beauty. They hate strength. Uh, they hate anything that is good. And they want to destroy it. This is the problem with the separation of church and state, because the the state, the, the if you read... Uh, the Gelasian correspondence with the emperor, Duo Sint. The, the temporal order, he says, if, if I start going crazy, you come and sack Rome. You come and sack Rome to get, to get me. Um, and so with, with the, 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 the church and state being separated and with the state then being cut off from grace, there is no balancing effect to the degeneration of the clergy, of the clerical 
order of the church. Um, and so we have this horrendous clericalization and we don't have the emperor to come in and we don't have that uh, regulation anymore. Yeah, I, 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 those, are, those are some very good points. You've said a lot of things I want to go kind of read into a little bit more. I'd say, two, you know, I guess just the last couple of things. One, if you, I think a lot of the opposition, though, to Francis and the church is not, I don't want to say not perfect, but there's, they have their own problems in a sense of, like, especially the clerical bishops and cardinals and stuff. Who are, yeah, they, 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 they haven't done much of anything. You know, they'll go around and give a talk and say, you know, he needs to be clear, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, they could have, if they would have in issued some sort of formal, you know, I, I don't know the correct, you know, canonical language that they planned on doing several years ago. What, one of those that they, yeah. yeah, that who died or whatever, mysterious. But um, the, um, it would have had a profounder effect. I think, you know, if we look at the example of the Crusades, you know, if you read especially the first Crusade, this these men should have died in the desert in Anatolia or like Turkey, but they didn't. I mean, there, there was this. A lot of people in the alt right celebrate the will to power, which is ultimately a demonic thing. There, there is a sense in which this courage and determination and strength is needed. Like that's it's God's grace. Absolutely, yeah. That 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 helped the Crusaders, but it's also the strength of these Norman knights. Do you have someone like Bishop? Uh... Tobin, the, 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 the better one, uh, in Rhodes Island, says something orthodox against uh, gay pride marches. Uh, yeah. He has a, a huge backlash, which reveals the religion of the secular world, of course. I don't know about Bishop Tobin himself, but I mean, there's, there's no question someone like Cardinal Dolan, there, there, there must be some sort of blackmail or something going on. You know, I mean, like, this yeah. is a discussion for another time. But yeah, yeah. Uh, that there is enough. Rod Dreyer, who himself, I don't, I don't know if you you listened to the talk I gave with Tim Kerr on him, and which I, you know he, he he himself was an intelligent asset at least at one point. He did say something very interesting that the end, like the the that their view scandal is a dark tunnel, and at the end it's really bad. Something to that effect. You know, I think the this sounds nuts, but the worst has yet to come out. You know, and I, I'm not going to go this uh, rabbit hole, but Jeffrey Epstein owns two islands yeah. in the U.S. Virgin Islands. The other one, they're still building construction on it. Two, people can look up the Detroit affair. I went too far down the rabbit hole. Some really disturbing things. You know, three, the, the, this, these breeding ranches Epstein was making. Four, revelations that, you know, I gave in a talk that other people have done on Cardinal Bernadine, the collection of Satanism. End result of this is satanic ritual and abuse involving human sacrifice. I know that sounds like a 1980s tier Protestant like rant, but that I well maybe those I, 90s Protestants were onto something. Yeah, I think they were right, and that that's this is what's going to come out. Conservatives have no guile. A conservative Saul Alinsky could have really slowed this horror, this tragedy down. You know, if for example. We we should come back at them when they, you know, in the 1980s, Jean Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Jacques Derrida, Foucault, all the usual suspects signed a public petition calling for the abolition of the age of consent, the legalization of paedophilia. Okay, um, I think I remember. Yeah, and and so the the right today should go. One of these mainstream media says, "Oh, you know, Jean Paul Sartre say." No, he's a paedophile. This is what he did, yeah. and actually, and actually, you know, have some guile, and, and because the left do that all the time. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, with, uh, the, in, in, if you follow the news in America, there's definitely, you know, in the past two years, a tremendous like increase in the political temperature. I mean, you can feel it. Uh, I've noticed it everywhere I've traveled in the country. I mean, there there, there is a breaking point that's coming about. Like, people are very angry, radicalized, so, like, you know, there's, the center has definitely fallen apart, which is probably a certain sense a good thing, where you have the radical left and you have the more kind of alternative right, which is I, enormous. And, and, you know, I, I think that the Antifa radical left types are a lot more, as we see in this, you know, Dayton, Ohio sh shooter, a lot more pervasive than even I thought. I thought, you know, maybe a few, like, drug addicts or whatever were, like, in 
Antifa, but it's 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 fairly large, mm -hmm. and it's protected by the media. It's protected by it's well funded by billionaires. Uh, yeah. So we're definitely headed to more chaos. The problem that is that'll just be the reason for the state to continue to clamp down on us. So instead of saying, well, we're going to take away all these Anglo-Saxon liberties because of um, Muslims blowing things up now that you know uh, alt-right people and Antifa people are shooting up WalMarts, then uh, we're going to take away all these other rights and have increased state control. I mean, that's that's the end result. Well. God chose from all eternity to 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 put you and I and everyone listening to live in these times to sanctify the the world in our age. He has a he has a, a role for us in 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 his mission, in his salvific mission in history. Absolutely, Doctor Russell, fascinating as ever. Uh, there's lots more for next time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you very much. God bless.